Welcome to Amsterdam, quite possibly the most photogenic place in the world. But what many people might not know about it is that Amsterdam also has an extremely active and vibrant community of writers who are writing in English. Amsterdam has attracted writers from all over the world and continues to inspire like few other places ever have before. I'm Bob Brager and welcome to my adopted home city. The Amsterdam Writers Platform has been created to introduce to you the writers who either live and work in this city or those who have been inspired by Amsterdam. Hi everybody and welcome back to Amsterdam Writers Platform. We are here today at an iconic location in Amsterdam, the Booksellers Alley, located in the heart of the University of Amsterdam the place where booksellers have been selling to students and to readers of all kinds since the 1600s. We're very lucky today to have as our guest Marie Phillips. Marie Phillips published her first novel, God's Behaving Badly, in 2007. It became an international bestseller and was translated into 20 languages. It was then made into a film starring Sharon Stone and Christopher Walken. Her second novel, The Table of Less Valued Nights, was published just this year in August. Welcome, Marie. Hi, and thank, thank you. you for coming. Thanks We're very so much. glad to have you here. I'm very glad to be here. But first, we have a little tradition, a new tradition, <laughs> that before we speak to our writers, we just open and share a bottle of a glass of wine. Lovely. So. Thank you. For you. Now, before we talk about the book, I want to welcome you to Amsterdam. Well, thank you. You've just moved here from London. I have. I've been here um, five days. Oh, very new, very well. I had three months here before, yes. um, but that wasn't really living here. And then, in the course of that time, I decided I wanted to be here yes. long term. So yes, I've been back in the city now for five days. Wonderful. Well, we're very glad that you're here. Well, what brought you here? Why would you want to move from a big city like London to a really a much smaller place like Amsterdam? Um, I really, well, for a start, I think Amsterdam is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I find it extraordinary. The architecture is stunning. The canals. Um, I love the human scale of it. Yeah. I feel that there's a scale to the, to the sort of human scale to the to the architecture, to the size of the city, but also to the pace. Yes. It just feels like um, it, it. It feels very calm. It feels very laid back, very friendly and welcoming. Um, yes. I, I really like the the unpretentiousness of it. Yes. Um, and all of this in what I consider to be just one of the most extraordinary packages, you know, the, the 17th century canals, yes. the, the wealth of history, the art, the culture, yes. it's just everything you could possibly want in a city and none of the stress. So it's wonderful. I think it's perfect. It's so wonderful I just, that you appreciate it. I slightly don't want everyone to know though. No, no. We'll keep <laughs> like, it a secret. Let's just keep it amongst ourselves. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people will come. <laughs> no. Well, Amsterdam is a treasure. Oh yeah. It really is a treasure. I love living here and, and, and it has inspired so many writers and that's the purpose of our program. Amsterdam Writers Platform yeah. is to talk about ways that people come here to meet their creative energies and to be inspired. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Um, I think that there's something. It has the best possible combination of life and peace, which you need both for if you're going to write. So yes. it has all of the inspiration yes. because there's so much going on, but at the same time somehow it manages to avoid being overwhelming. So you can then go back as you do as a writer into your solitude and just focus on the on the work. So that's that's ideal. I feel like if somewhere's too quiet, yes. then I'm liable to get maybe bored, maybe a little insular. Yes. If somewhere's too intense, yes. then I can't focus. Yes. And here it's it's the perfect balance. The balance is right. Yeah. Yes, I really do I do understand that. I do. Yeah. Now, well, we're delighted to have you here. 
We hope that you stay for a long time. I hope so. But first, let's just talk about, let's talk about the book. Sure. Let's talk about your new book. The Table of Less Valued Nights. What an interesting title. There was a table, and these nights were less valued? Well, what it does that mean? <laughs> it, I mean, I didn't make this up. They're really, I mean, uh, I already knew that I wanted to write a book about set in uh, Arthurian times. Yes. Amongst the Knights of... Um, amongst the Knights of Camelot, but I, I didn't quite know what I was going to do with it. Everything that I write is a comedy, so I knew that I needed to find a, a sort of a humorous angle on this story. Yes. And then in the course of my research, I came across a reference to this table of less valued nights. Right. Um, and essentially, the thinking behind this, this was, a, this was a, one of the original Arthurian texts, but a slightly more obscure French language one. There's a, a lot of French Arthurian material. Yes. And um, in this one, they talk about there's the there's the round table that we're all familiar with, yes. and then there's the table of errant companions, yes. errant in the sense of travelling as opposed to having made mistakes, and they're the sort of young upstarts who are waiting to get onto the round table, yes. sort of jockeying for position. Uh -huh. And then there's this table of less valued knights, which must yeah. have been wonderful when you're told that's where you're sitting. It's worse <laughs> than the kids' table. Yeah. Um, and the, the less valued knights according to legend, are mm -hmm. they're cowardly or they're injured, yeah. which is a little harsh, I think, yeah. especially if you've been injured in the line of duty, that of you're something of less value. Yes. But anyway, um, so yeah, so these less valued knights sat on there, sat, or, or are elderly, too old to go on quests anymore. Yes. And they never leave Camelot. Yes. They just sit in Camelot at their, at their I imagine, rather, rather rickety, ropey, probably not round, not right. special table, exactly. rectangular table. It's a um, table that isn't even even. Someone's got to stick a napkin underneath well, you know, to make it balance. I was convinced it would, because it's always so annoying, isn't it, when you're, when you're seated at a, at a rocking table that, and you're always like, folding up a beer mat or right. something to shove under, the, true. shove under the leg. So, um, but it's because they were less valued. Well, Nobody no cared. one could be bothered to get them a table that even could stand properly. That's right. So, yeah, so, so, so this so is the were, table Just let me understand. There were three ranks of knights. Mm. There was the round table that is famous, yes. that we all know about. Yeah. Then there was the, the table of, of errant, er, errant, companions. errant companions. Yeah. And these are the wannabes. These are the guys who yeah. want to be in the round table and they're sort of vying to yeah. get up there. Desperately there. hoping that another knight's gonna get killed. Desperately hoping. The minute so. someone gets you know, the minute someone gets sort of get, exactly. gets a lance through. Then, then there will be an open the errant the companions are. There I gotta tell you, there is an office politics oh, yeah. aspect of this. When I was, I studied the first page of your book, I read it several times, I was thinking I've worked in companies like this. Oh, yeah. I have worked in organizations where there's the, the main table, mm. which viewed itself as egalitarian. So it was round. Yeah. This is it what I love, because it's so obvious that the round table uh, is not egalitarian. Like yeah. And you read in the legends, it's always going on about egalitarian King Arthur and egalitarian. Well, for a start, if you're a king, you're not an egalitarian. Exactly. I mean, that's a definition. basic definition issue. Yes. But also, even if the table is round, yes. obviously, you can be sitting next to Arthur well, you can be sitting next to the rest, next to, you know, next to the kitchen. Exactly. exactly. So, so I felt that this whole business, and you all know, yeah. you know, that sort of Lancelot or Percival or whoever. Actually, some of the legends suggest that Percival started on the table of less valued knights. Really? But, yeah. But, um, but, you know, you know that Arthur, uh, sorry, that Lancelot or Galahad or so often are going to be able to sit near Arthur. Yes. And then whatever... You know, so there's always a pegging that you, you've, <laughs> that a never can thing. get into the legend. Exactly. And there's huge dispute even, you know, some of, the some of the legends say there were 13 knights at the round table and some of them say there were over 200. Really? So, yeah, so there's definitely a whole bunch of them that you never get to, to hear anything about. So, Gosh. no, there's no, there's no equality. But there was, there was this third pathetic, sad group mm, yeah. who were the less valued knights. And just imagine being told that that's your, that's your definition. I can easily imagine it. Yeah. I can, it, it reminds me of every company where I've ever worked. <laughs> People who wanted to be at the higher table. And, and so your characters are really focused, or most of your characters, the lead characters, yeah. are from that table. Yes. So um, it, when you read the Arthurian legends, one of the things that, that comes up repeatedly is that um, Pentecost was very key to the Arthurian legend. And that's every year at Pentecost, they would have a feast and they would be forbidden to, from leaving the feast until the Pentecost quest had turned up. And the, Pentecost the Pentecost quest. quest. The Pentecost quest. I see. So in, in the story, this um, 
self-styled king, shall we say, yes. called Edwin, turns up and says that his wife, the Queen Martha of Puddock, has been kidnapped, and he's looking for um, he's looking for a knight to 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 rescue her. Yes. So a knight duly volunteers and, this and is off the they quest. go. That's what a quest so is. That, so this is this very grand so a knight quest. for hire without pay. Absolutely. In, in my head, in my head, the whole thing actually is like um, a Raymond Chandler situation. Yes. Like, that's why he's called Humphrey, because of Humphrey Bogart. Oh, right. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of film noir and of, um, and of these sort of well, gumshoe detectives. Well, film noir, but funny. Yeah, and actually if you read Chandler, he talks about knights quite a bit. So uh -huh. it's, there's a real equivalence between the gumshoe detective Yep. And, and the knight. Right. So anyway, so, so Sir Dorian is the name of this round table knight who goes off on this extremely glamorous quest with this so he supposed gets the job. king. He gets the because job. Because he stands going, up the fast. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he's, stand up, he's been practicing standing yeah, up Yeah, he leaps fast. to his feet. Right. Um, but actually, Humphrey is a little bit sort of suspicious of this job because Edwin essentially comes across like a bit of an idiot, which in fact he turns out to be worse, worse than an idiot. Um, goes to sit at the, at the table, the goes, round table. He sneaks over to the he round table. He sneaks over to his old chair where he used to be. Yeah. He sits down and he the door opens. And he remembers being a, a, a knight of the round table and is thinking about you know what happened. Yes. And um, before he was demoted. Before he was demoted. Yes. And the door opens and in comes this maiden, um, Elaine, yes. who um, is all out of breath because she's late. She's arrived late. Yes. And um, her, she talks about her fiance was kidnapped on the yes. day of their betrothal. Yes. And Humphrey realizes that this must really be the Pentecost quest, quest because damsel in distress always trumps king. <laughs> Um, it's like a card game. Absolutely, and I sort of feel like there's a hierarchy, and the damsel of distress is right at the top. So right. he's thrilled that this, and this, and, he, and he's That's also right. noticed that she's rather pretty. Yes. And what he should do at this point is go and wake up a proper knight. So he's not supposed to take it he's because not he's to go a less valued knight. He's a less valued knight. He's not meant to go on any. Less valued knights may not. So he's supposed to go w wake up the party and he's, say, well, yeah. "Excuse me, we've got a real one here." Yeah, yeah. But and he doesn't do that. No, he doesn't. I, in my mind, he really has noticed that she's very pretty. Yes. I think that's quite a deciding factor in his mind. Anyway, there's a lot of sex in this book. Th there's a lot of sex in everything, though. <laughs> yes. It's part but of life. But funny sex. It's part of life. It's definitely not meant to turn you on, but it's certainly part of the general atmosphere between people. Yes. Um, anyway, so, so um, instead of going and waking up um, one of the other nights, yes. he wakes up the... Um, he wakes up his squire, squire. Conrad, who's a who's, he's a giant. Who's a giant, but a short giant. But doesn't so he doesn't scare anybody. No, no one is frightened of Conrad. It's terrible. Also, he doesn't have a very frightening personality either. No. He'd like to, but he's just <laughs> too sweet. Yes. Um, so much his resentment, and he rides an elephant everywhere. Yes. So again, the that elephant has named Jemima. Jemima. The who, elephant named Jemima. Who really everyone everyone around the country gets very excited about whenever they see her. So. Yes. Anyway, he goes there and gets There weren't a Conrad. lot of elephants in medieval England, I think. No, I don't think there were. I didn't... Um, I'm assuming that occasionally things would creep up from Africa. You know, yes. we, we had contact with Africa, so yes. people and, and been, animals yeah. might have passed through. But most people think this elephant is a monster. Yes. Um, or, or as one person puts it, a deformed horse. Yes. Um, but the key thing is how immensely funny these things are. I was sitting on an airplane yesterday reading your book, and it was a very crowded airplane. I was laughing out loud. This stuff is really, really, really funny. I hope you were holding the cover up so everyone could see I what was, you're laughing I at. I was. I That's was. That's the key thing. Because what you have is characters who behave in, in unexpected ways. You, you have a, a, a giant who is not frightening. You have a knight who is, who is frightened. You have um, a queen. Yes. A queen who runs away from her new husband, who will be king, because somebody shows her a book. <laughs> what was her teacher comes up to her and shows her a book. What was this book about? Well, it seemed to me that um, Martha, the queen, yes. it's, um, her mother died when she was young. Yes. And, um, so she, she's been raised without a female, a strong female influence in her life. She's had this governess, but right. not as she's, as she's and got And the governess older. rushes, forgive me, the governess rushes to the door. Yes. The night before her wedding, knocks the, the door and says, I must see you. There's something I forgot There's to tell you. There's something I forgot to mention. There's something I forgot to mention.
I want to thank you, Marie, for joining us today. I hope you're going to write many more books and keep us laughing with your wisdom. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today on Amsterdam Writers Platform.